Hello and welcome to This and That. I'm Dave Lees and Jonathan Byer is on location with my favorite color behind him. What's going all on? All the red, all the red for you, Dave. And for those not tracking at home, I still found a vase to put yes. in so we're New good. Bays, different bays. Yeah. Do so we like some, the pillow? Do sometimes we like when the I film, next? say it again. Do you like the pillow next to it? You maybe need to move the bays a little bit because your arm is like. Oh, you know. it's so far back there. I just. Oh. Read, it's like. Read. Yeah. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> uh, what's going you on? Know, when I film in Philadelphia and I have that big window behind me, <clears throat> that's in like the guest house where I stay, but the internet went out. So now I'm in the office in the main house. I've been allowed in the main house to film the skating lesson. You're so like one great. of the better servants now. You've been upgraded to the main mm -hmm. house. Mm -hmm. I'm ready for the royal visit and the John Abbey wedding. <laughs> there you go. A wonderful film where nothing happens. I loved it. Correct. And you know what? In this, I read um, a meme recently where it was like people that get anxious and struggle with that kind of energy like watching shows that they already know because they don't have to reach new conflicts. Or and I was like, oh my God, that's me. That's why at night I'm like, throw on the Golden Girls, throw on 30 Rock, Arrested Development, because I know how these resolve. So it's Dating competitions where you already know the results. Exactly. Although sometimes when you go back and watch Tanya occasionally, you're like, maybe it'll be different this time, but it never is. Oh my God, no. I like to watch, I do like to watch those, but I like to watch the old school skating before bed. It's mm. so calming. Watching yeah. Janet Lynn, Peggy Fleming. Come on, Peggy, do that double axle. You know, it's just. Exactly. Well, it, it's interesting because I was just saying this the other day that I actually, it's very stressful to be rooting for someone in an event. Like it does create this, you know, and who am I? I'm just watching the damn thing. Imagine the pressure they must feel because they really want to win. But it's so much more fun for me when I'm kind of neutral about the result, where I'm like, let's just see what happens at this event. When I'm really gunning for someone, it's, it can be a very stressful experience, so. I'm so jealous of your background. So if I'm staying here for a little bit longer, I'm going to get the green screen. But I go back and forth on what, if I'm staying well, in my apartment. Yeah. allow you to be on the beach and stuff like that? I don't think that's that. Um, <laughs> this, is the only, this is really the only room in my parents' house. People ask why the doors were coming, where like, you know, you won't hear my mother like in the back because I've been staying here during quarantine. So it's been- and it's tricky to, like sometimes actually with the windows as we knew when we were doing that world championship preview with Jenny, it, at certain hours when you have the window behind you, the light comes so the wrong way. Yes. So I have like this weird like decorative lamp over here that's like trying to cast some light on my face. <laughs> I love this zebra cow. Well, oh, yeah. Nice and nice yeah. black and white. Yeah, yeah, you know. I view this house that I come to, like this is the exploded version of my apartment. Oh. Like my apartment in New York, I've taken bits of all of this house and created it into a compact space. So. Fabulous. You know, and I was telling you, Jonathan, when are you going back there? Because Zoom works in Everyone. Well, you, it was actually you that inspired me because you were like, why did you come back to the city? Why aren't you still by the pool? Yeah, I wonder if we can even see it. The pool's out there. The pool, I mean. I mean, I what the hell was I doing in Harlem? Come on. <laughs> doing in Harlem, okay. <laughs> well, okay. do you want to start with terrible news? Um, yesterday, I guess it was overnight yesterday morning, um, I woke up to uh, that Ekaterina Alexandra, uh, Ekaterina Alexandra, it's about the emphasis Dina taught us. So, yeah. here, not to make it. Alexandrovskaya. Yeah. Katerina Alexandrovskaya. Sorry, I was like way ahead of myself. We have covered them, but I don't, we didn't cover them super in depthly. They were obviously won the World Junior Championships in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, they were at the 2018 Olympic Games representing Australia, and they um, you know, retired, or Katerina retired last season um, due to health issues related to epilepsy. Uh, but um, she committed suicide. Uh, By jumping from a window. Yeah. Yeah, really tragic, really tragic. Yeah, it's it's terrible. Um, I, uh, yeah. And there's no, as far as I know, and you correct me if I'm wrong, the articles that I've been reading um, so far in the news cycle have just stated who she is and that this happened. I don't, and then they said that the mother was, um, so upset from shock that she was also hospitalized. I can't even imagine. Yeah. Um, but so we still don't really have any more detailed information. Um, no, I mean, I spoke to someone who knew her, you know, and then, 
saw her maybe in in the fall and just said that she seemed distant and different but there's they said that maybe she was kind of homesick and down when she was in Montreal which is understandable for anyone who is shifting countries shifting languages shifting uh of course cultures. Shifting yeah. Cultures. yeah so I, I think yeah, we really don't know um there's going to be the film i think at the end of the month on hbo uh i'm gonna forget the title but um it is with sasha cohen gracie gold is in it uh michael phelps it's all about uh athlete mental health it's called the weight of gold um <laughs> And I think it's hopefully some of these issues will be delved into because certainly she has had to deal with uh, the ending of her career and that shift in identity, which is so difficult, as well as, you know, feelings about your career and, and things like that ending and develop, you know, devoting your life to something and having it. And especially with a health concern or a health issue, it, it's horrible, you know, so. Uh, and, and for so many elite athletes, and I mean, this can, you know, we've talked about it um, with your gymnastics interviews and everything, like the great one you just did, all this sorts of stuff. So many of these young people, I'm not saying this about her, I'm just saying in general, it creates a culture where your worth is based on that validation of a competition or on a coach. So when you're, when you take all that away and then you wake up, I think it would be a very strange thing to have retired from the thing that defined you and gave you so much purpose and validation your entire life for it to just be gone. Yeah. Um, I, I imagine it's a very, very difficult transition at a young age. Yeah. I guess it would be like getting like a nodule that ruined it. You know, at the Yeah. yeah. So yeah, uh, it, it terrible. Um yeah, we really I guess as we learn more, you know, we'll say, but really don't have yeah. any, you know, more information there. It's uh Really, really terrible. Is this one of the teams that Nina put together, yes? Or is, I thought something, I thought yeah. there was something happened where the Russian Federation could have assisted in creating this Australian team. Nina was involved with okay. the team, for sure. Okay. Uh, and is this the one that she, you know, there's a story of Nina, like just splitting people up mid-session and putting people together um, mid, like on a whim. Um, but I don't know if it was this team, but this team would have been around that time that they were yeah. matching skaters together. So, uh, yeah, but then they, they definitely trained in Montreal for a while. I know that they did train in Australia for a bit. And we covered them a bit, especially on the junior circuit. They had some really yeah. nice qualities to them. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just terrible. Um, also this week, uh, the podcast about the Corollis came out on Tuesday. Uh, I thought it was going to be, uh, like released one episode, one episode, one episode, one episode. It was released all day. It's funny. I had um, kind of thought I was going to read a book that day. That was also coming out, and then I was like, okay, I have to do this first. So, um, so tell me about it because you told me about it, but I have yet to explore that specific spot. The podcast. So this is heavy. The heavy metals. Yeah. Heavy, which is that's a cute title. Yeah. I mean, I know it's, it's a terrible subject, but like, it's a cute title. <laughs> well, yeah, it, um, it's seven episodes and it goes into their different periods of time. Um, I know that when they pitch these series, they often get a commitment for the number of episodes before they even finish the subject matter or the research. With this, I felt that seven episodes wasn't entirely enough um, okay. for different, I mean, there are so many different things that you can go into with them and there are so many people, you're never gonna cover everything, right? But I thought that they missed some really important people, subject matters, just about them as people, okay. about what they communicated and contributed to the sport. Uh, within you the US. feel like they missed it just because they were, they were just kind of um, skimming the surface or were they like afraid to go into certain places? So I think there are a couple issues. I think one of the bigger issues in my experience, when I see some Olympic reporters, not every Olympic reporter 
researches the same way Phil Hirsch does. And then not every Olympic reporter has the knowledge of each sport and knowing where to ask. These are this, I believe these are the team that put together the Tanya documentary. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a natural fit that they would then do gymnastics. But I just, I thought that they missed a couple of things. And sometimes when you rely on sources to get you people to go on camera, I just thought that they missed things. And because Nasser is obviously gonna be such a huge thing at the end, but I, they just missed things along the way. And I thought how they, I thought it was better. I think the first four episodes are really great. I think as they shift on, it's not necessarily as well done as it, could have been. I okay, thought the yeah. first maybe four episodes are really the strongest, maybe the fifth. And after that, I just thought, mm. I mean, there are some great moments in it and some interesting things that come out that are original reporting that are new, but it wasn't, I, I left a little disappointed towards the end. Okay. It, yeah. Well, I mean, it's a, it's a nice tie in to the interview. How, how do you pronounce his name? Uh, Geza Pojar. So. Okay. It's a je, Pojar. Okay. Um, what I loved was one that, um, this is just going to be a day of love fest, oh, that yeah. as we're doing the interview, suddenly they shift when they're like, oh, <laughs> and he even said as much like, oh, you know what you're talking about. Yeah. And it, it's not to slam other um, interviewers, but oftentimes people are assigned a thing. You know, when we have Hoda interviewing Marta Caroli being like, girls must work real hard. Yeah. Just like, Sure do, and that's the interview or something like that. Um, and again, this is the same thing we've even talked about with network coverage of s skating. You know, you don't have to dumb it down. You don't have to make it so fluffy. Get in there, and even if people don't know the specifics of what you're talking about, because obviously, I know more about skating than I know about gymnastics, and you have such a knowledge of both, but. So even when you were talking about particular gymnasts, I was less familiar with or the routines mm -hmm. that I was less familiar with, that it's besides the point because you're discussing concepts and you're discussing strategy and experiences and then the person learns. Then I'm watching a quality substantial interview that yeah. has so much more substance to it than like how to motivate a kid when you're having a tough day instead I don't know. I really appreciate that. And I think we could use more of that in sports journalism. We've talked about that with other skating documentaries. You know, it's coming from someone that just thinks Nancy and Tanya is the story. How do we tie it back there? Or we just think an eating disorder is the story. And it's like, I want to get into nitty gritty. Okay. I don't think that there, you know, there's a couple of things that all of these projects become shifted by the Nasser thing. And I'm sure that those are the interviews that they are most concerned with getting. That is the kind of information they want. And also which Nasser victims, some of these people want to get paid for interviews, some don't, some, you know, maybe don't want to get paid for this, but you know, for other things and, and they navigate all of that. And a lot of, a lot of this um, will be obviously John Manley, the attorney who represents many of the victims in these cases is often quoted and his clients are the ones quoted. So I think that he is really the connector for a lot of these um, media treatments, documentaries, books. So if you read the book, uh, Start By Believing, if you watched um, Athlete A, it, uh, At the Heart of Gold, if you watch, uh, if you listen to this, he is clearly one of the major source materials. And there are other things that are not his clients. So he's not giving that information it right and i think that they get so stuck on maybe what he can offer them but they miss some like really big things and and i think especially now bella crowley's first major gymnast in the u.s was diane durham who was african-american and she left and the reasons why she left are confusing um, but even in his book he says that race was a factor and that 
there were things. Now, if you read other books, they'll say that, yeah, Bella was very racial and perhaps racist in different ways um, over the years. So, and Tasha Schweikert talked about how they discussed her lines versus lines of another person in the actual podcast. Especially now, what happened to Diane Durham, I thought to not go into that, what happens and the fact that something happened at the trials where she got injured, he thought that he could petition her onto the Olympic team like he would be able to in Romania. He didn't know the rules at all. He didn't care to know the rules. And she would have had to do one more routine where she would have had to land one time on an injured ankle, but she arguably would have made it. She was right on the bubble because of him not knowing the rules and her getting hurt. Okay, so I got ahead of myself. She left, she wound up coming back. Okay, so she left, she came back and they're there at the Olympic trials. He doesn't know the rules. She winds up not making the team in US, which it was a boycott at Olympics. So it's kind of a marketing dream because it was held in the US. The US did so well, Mary Lou won. That never would have happened if it were in a fully attended Olympics. Right. Um, you know, maybe Mary Lou would have won a medal, maybe to, to at best. So the US team would not have medaled most likely. Uh, it just, it's just a huge story where the person she's then training with becomes a Dorothy Hamill-like cultural icon. Uh, I thought that that was like a really huge missed theme and opportunity. And then her life has never been as successful, certainly as Mary Lou's or other gymnasts. And I, I have an interview with her on Patreon, um, but I just thought like, how did that not really go into? They did an article about her paving the way for other African-American and black gymnasts, but they, they just, missed you know like that point they missed when he voted kim kelly off of the olympic team for not having the right body type in favor of his own gymnast and he had also done it the year before i mean that communicates so much about body image and everything and that's in other books i just like that's such a huge thing and that showed his power in the u.s even as an individual coach so they weren't like nitty gritty things. I was like, okay, they really missed certain, they never mentioned Vanessa Adler, what happened to her, they, like different things where he had, he was supposed to coach Vanessa Adler. They, there was a situation where it was either his directed or at what point she was gonna announce that she was leaving her coaches to train with him. And then they couldn't get in touch with him. And he took the job running the entire US after she had already fractured that relationship for him. and just like a whole season of, series of events. So I just felt like they didn't really go into what is, what is well, something And I don't, it's just, again, I'm sorry, I'm feeling so love festy this morning. <laughs> when you started and you created the skating lesson. The mm -hmm. point was that these interviews, these kinds of segments weren't just like getting to know someone, they educate. If I am going to listen to a seven episode podcast, I want to be learning, not yeah. just recycling the same sensationalist headlines I already know. Mm -hmm. um, and that was what was kind of interesting about Athlete A in this whole situation is it focused on a very dark, terrible situation in Dr. Nassar, which needed to be talked about. But as you've mentioned, like, that's like one part of this enormous puzzle. Like, there is so much more to look at here. And everyone's so tunnel visioned on this one part, which is terrible and should be looked at. But what about this whole other part that like allowed for that to happen? That like, this isn't about an incident. This is about an entire structure and a culture. And that was coming out in your interview with um, the choreographer as well. Unfortunately, in all of these recent pieces, I think what's frustrating is I think that people miss the overarching point because they make the argument in both Athlete A and both um, uh, uh, heavy metals that Maggie Nichols was robbed of going to the Olympics and they imply it. And I believe that there is gonna be stuff that is gonna come out about maybe there were deals to get certain gymnasts on teams. That has been there around for a while. And there are there's a lot of things, if you look at it, that just are really unclear. Like which gymnasts maybe have NDAs, which ones don't? Why don't we hear from certain gymnasts who were so in the media before, and then now we don't hear anything from them? Right. 
Why hasn't Gabby Douglas, who said that she was a victim, sued USA Gymnastics? That's very, knowing her mom and, and all of the machinations in that career, that's strange, right? And I don't, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, right. But there are certainly things if you, as reporters, I think that people to look into. Um, I don't think there are many Olympic reporters that are really doing that kind of work. I think Scott Reed of the OC Register is. I don't think that there are many who are really still out there. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, you, you look to different things and, and it's um, confusing, but they okay. make the argument that Maggie Nichols deserved to make the Olympic team. And then a lot of fans are like, but she didn't look that great at the trials. And I think that like, it obscures it like, you know, it ruins the piece for them. But I think the bigger thing is, was she even considered? Was that team decided months in advance, right? right. right. Are the trials even really the trials? Or at what point is that team decided because they've already doled out the endorsements and that Steve Penny was such an expert marketer? You know, if Steve Penny were in charge of the USFS, that whole bit with Ashley probably would not have happened. He would not have the girl go in, he would not be in charge of which girls are potentially getting um, endorsements because, in, and what happens is, is that many of the Olympic uh, endorsements go to Olympic approved sponsors, which are the same sponsors that then will sponsor US figure skating or USA gymnastics. And then when you see someone like Ashley Wagner or Nathan Chen get a tire, um, advertisement when tires are uh, promoting nationals as the title sponsor. Certainly the Federation is involved in that conversation right. about which person should be sponsored because the tire people are not... Um, Aficionados, most likely. Yeah, yes, okay. Yeah. And the same thing happens in gymnastics when they go out and about to get those Olympic sponsorships, especially with these specific brands that have to be Olympic um, title sponsors as well, Olympic sponsors. So it's um, a little bit more complicated. So Steve Penning is someone that when you look and Gabby Douglas has the sponsorship and then Gabby Douglas is put to the Olympics, you know, that's a clear decision that was made months in advance and maybe the trials are more of an afterthought. Yeah. But this is a business for them as well, right? For us well, and, and we go back on back and forth on this because again, as the media picks things up, and we've talked about it endlessly. Like for instance, the Marai versus Ashley 2014 thing. If you knew the sport, mm -hmm. you knew 100% what was going on. Mm -hmm. You knew 100% why the decision they made to keep Marai off the team was correct. So when you get people saying, well, Marai was fourth at the last Olympics, and you're like, wow, you are so not the person to be speaking on this then, if you think that has any relevance to what's happening for you. Sorry, everyone, Jonathan was talking and I'd like him to rewind to what he was saying, but I'm just gonna go back to where it was. You, you even think I remember what the hell I was saying. I think we were just talking about Marai and how the Marai versus Ashley situation, for example, when given over to the press, they create all these like weird outlandish connections like Mariah's performance in Vancouver was somehow supposed to do th something or when, when people outside of the sport are making these sensationalistic kind of conclusions and you're like, if you followed the Grand Prix season, if you knew the Grand Prix final, if you knew the, the way the judges were marking PCS, if you knew there was a team event, like we made the right decision despite the trials, um, I don't know, it's, it's tricky when handed over. And um, we've said the same about um, many Surya documentaries when they're talking about Surya landed eight triples here. And we're like, I know you're saying that, but if you understand the sport, you know that none of them were rotated and they all had stiff landings. So the quality was higher with another skater. It's, it's tricky and I just wish there was more knowledgeable insight when they do these interviews and movies because of course now everyone's gonna say, Nasser, 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 like so, and that's going to be the only thing discussed when it should be discussed. But there's so much more underneath it. And again, like you're saying, they're making it like kind of like a lifetime original movie where the hinge of it was that she didn't make the Olympics. I might argue the hinge of her story is that she was abused in the first place. <laughs> like that's the horrifying part of the story. Not that she didn't make alternate, you know, for the Olympics. I it's tricky. Yeah. So a couple thoughts. Um, 
first thing, my dad interrupted because he wanted to do Pilates. And this is why I do it in this room in the house. And I was, first of all, my parents go for a, one hour. Yeah. <laughs> my parents go for a bike ride every Sunday. And even though I was filming and my dad could hear that I was filming, he was like, are we, are we working out? Are we working out? What's going on? Are we, are we working out? And, uh, Emergency, they need to know right now. <laughs> so, this is why I do it in front of the closet doors. Otherwise, I could do it against where those old fans were in the room. I, I didn't like that as much. Oh, yeah, yeah. Background as people leave comments. Okay. So, okay. Yes, it's, it's very true. Okay. Otherwise, you could have my mother on the skating lesson, who's now opening, being like, oh, well, I, I can I, hear I, you. Rob. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So, <laughs> this is why you're we do it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, these are things that happened. The quarantine has been really long, people. Okay. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, um, I think when, when they do try to go more in depth, if you go into the Surya piece, um, they actually did get Sandra to- Now this is on Radio Lab. we're talking about- Radio Lab. Versus Radio. the Netflix one, yeah. yeah. Yes, they actually got Sandra to be the other side, right? But because they didn't have more than just Sandra and they had multiple people on the other side, saying that Syria was robbed, someone could listen to Sandra and be like, oh my goodness, she was brilliant. And even the radio lab people were like, oh my God, like she's talking about something and she's giving us like this. See, I have to felt like they made fun of her. I almost felt like they thought she was silly for talking about edges and the magic of skating. And I was like, but if you're listening, she's the most informed person you're talking to. She's yeah. giving you the explanation and you're choosing to make it sound silly or uh, pretentious. I felt like they thought her, yes. her talking about those blades was pretentious and she was actually just explaining kind of what the sport is. And I am, I am not saying that Surya did not experience racism in her. In, yeah judging or something like that. But what I am saying is the reasons people think she should have placed higher are not necessarily true when you know about the quality of the skating. Yeah. So. It's so complicated. It, it, it's even been complicated. I'll get a lot of messages like, why don't you post about this? And what about this person? And it's like, well, I can't, like, it just, I don't believe that, you know? Like, right, exactly. Yeah. There, there are some things that are very real problems. When there are real judging problems, they have to be discussed. A lot of it is subjective, you know what I mean? Like, we know tons of fans that, again, think the ISU is evil because of the way certain skaters are marked. Obviously, we know this is absurd, do you know what I mean, in certain categories. But in other things, we do know backdoor dealings are happening that, that really create problems. I mean, no more obvious, I felt, than when we judged the 98 dance. Did yeah. you realize what a racket it was? Yeah, um, I do think that the, when I was going on about um, you know, the endorsement deals and whatnot, I do think that for as much as you want to say about how evil USA Gymnastics is and not saying anything to the contrary, I think it speaks to how dysfunctional US figure skating is that they film commercials with Ashley not a lot of top skaters in the US, right? And at that point in time, she was the she was the world silver medalist. She had been on the podium at nationals all these years. She was a safe bet. Karen was a question mark. Brady was newish. We didn't know what was happening. They even tried to put Paulina down. We knew Paulina was out of the running. Mariah was very, you know, unreliable. Um, that was, I, I mean, I understood why they picked her. And Ashley was known a bit from the previous yeah. Olympics returning a personality for people to build on. Think about the dysfunction of U.S. figure skating that in the, that she's the one they're choosing. And then some people argue that it's just certain judges that got Ashley fatigue and wanted to not give her the normal nationals boost. Others say that is leadership involved in communicating those thoughts? There are different theories there that can't really be proven, right? So, but you look at it and you're like, how would you reverse strategy, <laughs> right? Because, because they use the results as a reflection, right? So then to have judges change the reflection on that, but judges who are also accused of falling in line of doing what they're expected to do and do what they're wanted to do and 
you know, the, of the politics of the time. Uh, I mean, there's, of course, there's influence going on of different people and things. Well, we like knew several judges on the panel in 2014, and when Mariah hit and Ashley imploded, mm -hmm. I remember seeing those judges' faces in that moment saying, like, shit, we don't, we can't help it. Yes, yeah. we have to do. With the Karen and Ashley thing, they did have more of a choice, in my opinion. They had more of a choice, but then once she was fourth, you cannot put a white girl, oh, the same one over right. Right. two again. You cannot do that. You can, um, but that was arguably intentional, right? That also, I can't say that Ashley would have been any better than any of the Americans. Yeah, she would have placed in the same mix because also, I mean, Ashley had, had kind of peaked. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that she was going to give us a breakout performance or a memorable performance or or be able to affect one way or the other, the bronze medal choice. You know I mean, what I mean? How awful Steve Penny is, but at least from a marketing and leadership standpoint, in terms of developing personalities and putting people out front. Right. Not going to promote someone, get them on commercial spots so that people actually know who that is and then have them not make the Olympic. That's not going to happen. Well, and it's really interesting because the way they market those gymnasts, it always looked on the outside, which obviously, and again, in your interview, when he was like, you have two Bellas, the TV Bella, and then the actual one, mm -hmm. in the same way, you would see all of the gymnasts and they portrayed as the outsider at the time watching the Olympics as a bunch of fun girls that had great energy. It was like a school spirit and they were like going to do it and they were all together and rooting for everybody and they're having a blast. And the skaters, you know, often, even, even the smartest ones, the most talented ones, it's a bit more wet noodly in general. So that when a rare personality comes across like Ashley or an Adam or something like that, we all clamor to be like, look how personable they are because for some reason they're not, they're not PR coached or media coached to be fun and so likable. They're more the student. It used to be you had Tara had personality, Bobek had personality, Michelle had je ne sais quoi on the ice, maybe not yeah, as but not necessarily, and this is, I mean, yeah. she, she's a kid, you know, I mean, but it was a more, she was still a more serious, respectable person. And they I think that her like, like crazy in the media, right? Like they knew how to, it. Yeah. yeah. The gymnasts were Shannon Miller, Carrie Strug, Dominic Dawes didn't even say much. Uh, they had Mojano, who was certainly uh, not oh, yeah. bubbly yeah. personality, but they didn't have those person. They did not have those in '96, which is why gymnastics didn't sustain as much, as well as they didn't have any returning. Well, I loved in the interview when he called Carrie Strug the church lady. Yes, I was like, oh gosh, <laughs> okay. She's also Jewish, but I mean, you know. Okay, let me just say. Okay. <laughs> things Gaza said. And then he said, when he kept referring to her dad as Papa Strug, yes. it sounded like Papa Smurf to me. Like it was such a funny kind of way to refer to someone's parent. So one thing that I have wondered about the Carolis for, because remember I told you that I started researching them and then the Nasser thing broke. Right, and then, kind of took it a different way, yeah. One of the themes that I think would be really interesting to delve into with them is, are they from a situation in a communist country where they are more elite than other people and are also somewhat classist in how they deal with people? Because how come, in Mosianu's book, she said that, you know, the, the uh, Karolis are Hungarian. Now, both of Marta's parents worked. Her dad was a bank vice president. And I asked Geza this over text yesterday. I said, was Marta more well off than other people in Romania? And he said, by Romanian standards, yes. No, I'm not sure about Bella. He did say his dad was a bureaucrat of some kind and wanted him to go to college instead of being like a physical fitness coach. They didn't like that girl, Hillary Grivich, not the biggest talent, but he also, even Geza said, oh, her parents were poor people. So Hillary Grivich's dad was a poet. They didn't have a lot of money. And Bella knew that, like that mattered in terms of how he dealt with a her. Status, kind of, yeah, totally. They never yelled at Carrie Strug. Her dad's a heart surgeon from uh, Arizona who can buy and sell all of them. The Crowleys just seem very politically astute to those kinds of 
What's how they climb, don't you think? Yes. I mean, it was also interesting. Okay, so this is a little bit of a journey, and then we'll go right back to it. I also loved when he was talking about that they went to Latvia um, for the event, and were finally talking to other people, and it basically came out that um, Bella's success was based on his personality, not his information. Yeah. Right? They were finally giving him information there. And then that nonsense when the government pulled them from the world championships. because oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And then th suddenly there's a private plane and there's like all of this sort of stuff. It's very, and, and I thought he used a term where he called it um, like their elite status in the communist system. That it wasn't necessarily money, but they had reached, it was like red. Red stat, red, yes, something. Do you, do you remember this? It was a particular term that he used and I was like, oh, it's exactly what we talked about with Katerina Vitt in, in, in the, late 80s and all the perks she was getting and how she climbed in the system this way. So they were very clearly climbing a system that was very important to them. And I, I just think if you align yourself with other people that are also high on that system, the better. And I can't tell, I don't remember specifically, this is coming from my, I did an interview with Dominic Machano once um, years ago, and I don't know if this attitude came forward then or in her book as well, but. I got the sense that Bella thought that her parents were like Romanian immigrant trash. And the fact that her dad was like a car salesman to make ends meet, they, they didn't, even though Bella paints this immigrant story, I, I don't think that that was something that they respected, right? They respect right. Harry Strug's parents who had all the money. Kim Zemeskel, if you look at those things, her house looked very nice in Houston. There are different ways that they treat different girls. I, I do think that that is, Heart. I mean, I think your I think your talent can be currency, and and they're all paying the same tuition. Oh, it's it's amazing. Actually, no, that's not true. Dominic Mochani's parents were always made to pay full tuition, even though they didn't have money. He paid Jenny Thompson fifty grand to come back and train with with him at one point in the mid nineties, or he paid because they were moving back and forth so much. So these are people that there is like a also like a classist element to that it's just that a hundred when we have a tanya and we have um a nicole mm -hmm. compared to a tara and compared to um who would be another one uh christy even do you know what i mean you, you just suddenly embrace the full image and it's just like an easier more reliable thing they seem to think yeah, is I mean, skating is always accused of being classist. In gymnastics, not as much, but I think we're seeing, if you really look into it, and I, I do believe that the Carolis have an element of that. I think obviously there are some when they are, do they treat Simone better than Gabby if Simone comes from more money? Obviously Simone also has more talent, but, you know, potentially, right. but Gabby's also extremely talented. So, I mean, you, you just don't, right. Like, why do they know these kinds of things about people? <laughs> you know, that, I mean, if it didn't matter, um, just all sorts of things. I mean, there's it, there's an interesting story about how they climbed and, and the things that they would know how to do. So, I mean, I think you could do 50 documentaries of them for years and learn something new every time. But I did think that the fact that they missed so much about Nadia's story and so much about like what happened with the government and, and all of that it, in the 30 for 30, I was like, there's a lot there that can be, yeah, but Nadia yeah. doesn't speak at all. Yeah. <laughs> so she, someone left a comment, that someone have to tick Nadia off enough to talk, but it, I get the sense, I talked to Bart once, um, talking to Paul Zert, I get the sense that Nadia lived that part of her life and chooses to <laughs> be private and just, she'll do certain kinds of interviews, you know, like when they're revisiting her perfect 10, but that kind of a thing does not go in. And I, I do believe that when they came to the US, it certainly was in all of their best interests to put on a front that we like the Carolis, we make money by towing the party line and that's it. And I think people have a lot of questions about Geza and what is his complicity. And I do think that that's a real conversation to be had. Um, and that's a difficult one because he, he was reporting to the secret police what they were doing in Romania the whole time. 
So if people had a problem with Bella beating someone, and, and also people said, people asked, are those stories true? You know, what, you know is, this, is this just sour grapes years later? One of the things that we don't realize because of, again, talking about how the reporters and things like that, like Christine Brennan doesn't cover gymnastics, that's covered by Nancy Armour. Nancy Armour is someone that I called out for being too close to USA Gymnastics at the time in, in the Olympics based, based on her reporting. We've also never seen Nancy really write about the Nasser scandal. So I was a little bit, um, how delayed she was. It took her like eight or nine months to ever write anything. And right. when she was had so much access to USA Gymnastics before, right. and then she was quoted here, I thought that that was really inappropriate. When someone else from the USA Today Network was breaking that story and she was right. really not saying anything for a long time. And then for her to act like, oh yeah, I knew, yeah, oh, I mean that awful, you know. Yeah please, you were trying to get the exclusive interview with Marta when right. the one reporter she would talk to. Um, and they were all playing game, but they, I mean, the media was just ridiculous by 2016. I mean, but there were so many things that were out there in public about the Carolis. There had been stuff that was written for 30 years that if you didn't know that these people were horribly verbally abusive, right. hard, emotionally abusive, you... Well, and that's what so I meant. Professional. You know, like you oh, had an... an Hoda doing smiles saying, aren't girls hard workers and every, isn't it great to achieve a goal you've set out to do or something? And you're like, is this the twilight zone? Like what? So I question Hoda because she has such a different position in society and status in life. Yeah, but yeah. other people, but I did think that NBC in general, and I've talked to Sandra about this, like what does NBC know? What should they know? I do think that over 30 years with the Carolis, and all the media representations, all the books that have come out about them being in newspaper articles, your head has to be completely in the sand in that position as a producer, not to know. But I believe many are. So you tell me the difference here if I'm getting this wrong. The director of NBC, who's worked in a job for so long, if you know how the Carolis are, you know that these books, these people, these articles come out every Olympics about them and they're winning. At a certain point, did you choose to just focus on the winning when you make the hour long puff piece documentary to then promote your Olympics on the Carolis? Like To me, that's disgusting, right? Like that's, How yes, I there's a documentary on them, but I want the whole picture. I don't want the one where it looks like they've seen approval. You know, that's- Do they know really the producers? So my question is like, um, for instance, someone like Terry Gamble, let's just use as an example. He's a basketball guy, but he's been covering skating so long. He clearly is, understands what's happening. I don't happening. expect him to know, right? Right. But like a producer, is this someone who's just like following gymnastics or the, in the skating, do they follow the skating? Or is this someone who does equestrian and fencing and kayaking and skating and we're just looking for angles and we're just looking for cheap sells to broad audience? Over 30 years. Right? The same people. So yes. these people should know then you're saying they At are- At certain point, David Michael retired, right? And Alan, but even them, they were, Bella was the storyline and Kathy Johnson Clark talks about it. Yeah. Come on. I mean, when he voted that girl off the Olympics, NBC covered that, right? That's in the history article. I mean, there are just like so many different elements here. Dominique's broken leg was like, the big story of 96. And what's hilarious to me is that Bella said, oh, I knew Nasser like walking across in the gym. When you go and rewatch the 96 Olympic trials, Dominic's doctor for the leg was, they were like, we talked to Dr. Nasser and he said the leg is fine, to, will be fine to compete on at the Olympics. Right. And like, oh, you have the soundbite right freaking there that it's, right. you know, it's just different stuff. You talk about different people's things. It's just like a, a very glib surface level of reporting that I think is, in this case, something so nuanced. We focus so much on like specific people. I would just like to see more, a more diversity of uh, people that are speaking or talking about um, the Carolis and Nasser. I'm getting sick of seeing the same people in every piece. And, and this, is, this is to me, I wonder if it's in the target audience, if they feel like each time they do something, 
they're they're like bringing all these new people to the story. Um, for instance, did you watch the Jane Jeff and Matt have become like this speaker? You know, the, the, the spoke, but how much time did they spend at the ramp? They spent maybe a year and around Nasser, but there are other people that spent years with him. I yeah. want to hear from those people as well. Not that I don't want to hear from Jamie and Jeanette, but I would like to hear from people that had longer relationships. And I feel a lot of the viewers are going to be the people seeking out this content, not stumbling upon it and learning about it. So when we seek out content that is specific, and it's like the same formula for everyone, why, why are you doing it? It already exists. We've already heard from this person. We've already heard this generic soundbite. Like, I'm looking for something honest. Again, when I first found the skating lesson, you interviewed some people that had been interviewed by several other platforms where we hear the same stories. We hear about the same inspirations, the same anecdotes. And then suddenly you get into something specific and we're having a real conversation. That's so much more informative to me. I want to know the nitty gritty. I want to know from the unexpected sources who are now and I would think as a journalist, that's what gets your story coverage and traction is to provide the untold portion, not yeah. just rehashing, trying to cash in on a, on a headline and you're just recycling it, I feel. But I think that skating doesn't have that at all. And I think that that's why the Coughlin story was able to die. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they don't even have Ice Network anymore. And NBC right. covers it, hasn't really, taking that space. No, out. and, and are you getting some of this NBC Olympic coverage, which is still like reporting that Adelina Sotnikova might not compete in the next Olympics or something. You're like, this is, these aren't stories we need, you know. But that's the story that'll get them clicks from Russia. Is that true though? Does that really, I mean, I feel like there's such like a lack of faith in the For the mainstream public, it might get them on the website, the people that don't know. They'd be like, oh. The American mainstreams don't even know who she is anyway, so you might as well just- Not talk. American mainstreams, the internet. They might get clicks yeah. from- Okay. Russia or the, I mean, a lot of things, a lot of decisions that are, that internet news is based on what's gonna get you clicks and yeah. who cares about what in, in, yeah. in that way. So I do think that that's why when you don't have Phil and you don't have John Powers from Boston and you don't have maybe Helene Elliott, you know, and people really coming and replacing them and they're, you're missing certain things. Then you can dismiss someone as just being a blogger or just doing this. And right. someone who does get in that situation maybe doesn't have the big knowledge or the big platform and things like that. And, you know, Deadspin had people and then they were all fired and, you know, and there's no um, next generation reporting. And right. I think Phil really s had said that for years that, you know, these jobs aren't going to be replaced because of the newspaper industry and things like that. So yeah, it's a, a huge, um, problem you know I, I just and then we miss a lot because um i i became indoctrinated in skating through christine's books through phil's articles and you know and it, it just then i wanted to know more and then i became a super fan you know what i mean so it's um and so when everything's just an occasional right. youtube clip or like a, a psycho fan on twitter or something like that it doesn't it doesn't quite pull you in the same way I was I always wonder about like the fans today and how they learn skating and get used to it. And I know that myself, um, you know, I remember getting indoctrinated skating by watching something on TV, recording it, rewatching it a million times because it was the only skating I had, you know, or you I would buy. I want someone like Dick to, to inform us how he was modeling critical thinking with us. He wasn't like sassily promoting soul cycle or making an outrageous compliment with a fun vocabulary word he was showing us to look at this foot in this spin if the foot is this way in the layback we like it if the foot isn't we don't like it now the next time i'm watching on my own i'm already that much more engaged as a viewer because i know what i'm looking for i you know and i just find that's missing you know, this this girl was like oh i should read little girls in pretty boxes she said you've only talked about it for years and i was like well, yeah, you should. I, I just remember being, I mean, my mom works at the library, right? So I grew up going to the library and researching gymnastics book, figure skinning book, and taking them all out and like devouring them, you know? Yes. That's yes. what was available, right? And ordering them from other libraries and then coming in and, and things like that. And the VHS tape on Torvald and Dean and, and all of that stuff. And 
support your libraries. Uh, but you know, I loved that VHS where they went back and did all of their old programs because this was also before YouTube. So that's how I saw the Barnum program. That's how I saw the Mac and Mabel program. That's how I saw the Pasa Dode Life. Because again, if I relied on just what was being pumped out in the media, it was just like the same clip from Bolero over and over again. But they become so much more impressive when you actually learn the trajectory of all of their output. And that was a culmination, yeah. Then I started getting all of the opera music and all of the uh, the ballet scores and things like that. Yeah. My, my uh, pretentious self. But anyway, you know, these are, yeah. It, just an interesting thing in the lack of coverage. I mean, we see so many, even from the skating reporters, we got an interview with the Terry who doesn't speak to many people. And the only thing we learned is that her daughter's medals give her greater joy. Right. But there was an interview and I thought, you know, there's so much, to ask a Terry, even if you want to do like just like a very right. positive thing, I would want to know, because obviously if you get to talk to a Terry, you know you cannot ask. Right, she won't, yeah. That's going to be someone who's guarded. And, and Unless you want a one and done interview and you want to go for it, right? That's what you have to, right? I think that when you ask those questions, I would want to know like what their plan is for training, what how they're going to keep... Um, these skaters motivated if there are competitions that there aren't what are the plans etc cetera, etc cetera, because we really don't know what is going to happen and i and are her skaters growing are these going to be the skaters that make it or are they going to focus on the next generation and i think that that's going to be a huge storyline if there even are 2022 olympics you know what is going to happen there and i think that that's um really interesting um I, I don't know, there's just like so much you could get from her. Obviously she's a person that has a lot of information. Agree with her, disagree with her. She's a person that's interesting uh, to speak to. I would be curious, she was at the ultimate, perhaps peak of her career. When you look at when, and we don't know, she could reach another peak, right? But she was certainly peaking uh, this year. She was set up to most likely sweep sweep and had two of the three medals at the junior worlds right she cannot do much better than that in her career ever right what is the motivation what are her goals for the future you know like w does she want to oversee skating like she's someone with a lot of ambition that becomes perhaps boring to certain people even the carolis they move from being individual coaches to running something it has happened with Arena Wiener. Someone of a Terry Tuparisa statue, I would imagine, could have ambitions beyond just personal coaching. Just right. and where is the feeling for her? Yeah, it could be endless. Her climb. Think about how boring that would be if you've already done it. How many junior yeah. are you going to go to when you're a Terry? That's right. why I'm always shocked when Ryan goes to them. Like that much traveling because that's exhausting. But over time, she's done that, right? What is the next hurdle? So- And for all you know, you know what I mean? Like, of course she would be close to the idea of like, what about injuries? What about da 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 da? Or, you know, if she felt attacked, but like the idea of how far could you go would be very interesting because by the same token, she's, she's a woman that doesn't take a lot of bullshit. I would imagine like, she's probably pretty sick of the same questions. We always hear like, why women and less men? And so in this one, the most recent one, she's just like, I, I train these men and just listed men. And I was like, this is not interesting for her either. Also, you know, it's, it's Uno, Terry. what happened with Shom Uno? What was his deal? What was that situation? Instead, we literally got a soundbite that said it was a thrill just to be nominated, which I don't know. I use this like the cliche benchmark for just flop bullshit answer. Mm -hmm. It's a thrill just to be nominated. I, no, was I, like, I think that was for like a skating Russia publication. So obviously they're not going to Take okay. that much, but you could still. It would be interesting just to know those kinds of questions. I that's we also saw. Remember the hot, yes, yes, coach that was always on Instagram in his yes. like white speedo. Victor, I know. what he kind of disappear on Instagram because uh, th that was some um spicy content. Well, I've watched some HBO documentaries, I don't, I don't know if it's really safe to be like that. Um, it's something I wondered also when it kind of disappeared. Yeah. So uh, I just thought it was interesting to see certain people that 
know how to maneuver in Russia, that know how to give an interview to, to like paint the party line. I was like, oh, we haven't, we haven't heard from Viktor Adinev in a while. He was kissing everyone's behind. Oh my goodness, everyone was great. You yeah. know, Poker Elias coach, amazing. Terry, oh, she was incredible. This, but that's someone that needs a job, right? Like that. And I can't blame him. No, you can't blame him. I can't blame him for trying, you know? But I thought that that was like a really interesting article. I was like, oh, we haven't heard from him in a while. We get a picture of him and it's oh. It's funny when it's so obvious. Yes. Like it was from, from the first sentence, I was like, oh, this is one of those interviews. Yes. Yeah. But it might work. Let's see if we see him someplace. Yeah, some people are seduced by that. Even though it seems so obvious to us what's happening. Is he like, place hot Sergey? Is that the is that the angle you were getting as like the junior kind of coach for a Terry school? Oh, I, could be. I, I was thinking that that was kind of his maybe his kind of MO, what he was perhaps looking for. Hmm. I mean, please, that would be a career opportunity for anyone to work under a Terry and to have that. Nice to see him in the kiss and cry again. <laughs> so I, I just was like, oh, this is that interview. Okay, that's his, he's not trying to get a job in America. Yeah. This is yeah. an application, <laughs> yeah. But amazing, it's very smart. Yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. I want to mm-hmm. see if he lands. Okay, that was... Unlike Pogo <laughs> Jonathan, Jonathan, yes. And- and funny and true. Um, anyway, uh, I think, yeah, I, I don't know. It was just, we'll have to see. Uh, we did have the first virtual competition of skating and there has, there was a virtual competition with rhythmic gymnastics. I watched a little bit of it. Um, there was now a virtual competition skating, the Peggy Fleming trophy, which is Unfortunately, I don't think that they really explain the rules. Are they, is it like, why are we, how do they judge? Is it judged where you do like certain elements and then certain, like that whole thing I don't think was expressly. I, and I have to say the press around this was poor. Well, like um, they, they were promoting it. This is not a prestigious event. They, uh, yeah, didn't yeah. Get, they didn't get Terry Gannon to host it. They got the girl from US Figure Skating to go on camera. I mean, she did her best, but this is not, um, she was pretending like it was a stressful competition. Oh, returning and moving into the lead. And that- Well, it still could have gotten, it still could have been more of a moment because we're all so hungry for something. I know, I just want to know how they, how you really judge and come on. Right. The whole yeah. thing. Um, it does seem like, and I also have to say, so it seems like technical elements play a role in this, right? right? Awkward then that you have the men competing against the women and the men win every year over a technical advantage perhaps. Maybe there should be two categories. I don't know, it just seems weird to me that the men win every year and you kind of know like, oh, well the men are gonna jump better and they perhaps, you know, for this event, especially with the entries. Um, uh, Cause you know, there are current some missed opportunities. They have Star Andrews uh, performing to Black Like Me. That is what I would put on social media for oh, US figure yeah. skating. Yes. You want people to share that. I would put Jason's whole program up mm-hmm. and those are you get your shares. That's where you get people really cluing in, not a clip, do the whole thing right. on your Facebook and, and that way, um, because he did such an am- Jason Brown's performance was mesmerizing. It was really, um, I thought, incredible. Well, and that's I, one, I mean, when you're when you're built as like the sensitive artist, like I believe he is, he was probably desperate to finally do this. I think he's really developed that sensitive artist side over the last. He's gone from a performer to more of an artiste, and I think yeah. we're. Seeing Which that. comes with age and perspective, some of that inherently, no matter how you start, it's even greater now, yeah. So I thought he was mesmerizing. I hope he does do that as a modified short program or something along those lines. I thought it was stunning or have that, maybe that'll be his exhibition show. Pro- it, it was amazing. Um, I thought Tim Delensky looked really good for someone to see competitive skating, then moving into uh, you know, he's been performing professionally and you could see that he's built for it. I don't know why the Zamboni was on the ice for the entire 
Just hanging out, yeah. <laughs> a prop. He's, he's embracing his long hair and his like flowy Archer Dimitriev costumes going on here and his Josh Groban music, which I know Jonathan will hate. Uh -huh. And uh, like, uh -huh. he's just living his best life out there on the ice. Again, someone I wonder about what their trajectory is, um, but always nice to see. Well, I think the trajectory for anyone as a show skater right now is yeah. up in the air. Yeah. How long until we go back on cruises? I don't know. I mean, there are some people that I think will, but as an industry as a whole, you that's... make up the skating show. Well, but yeah, and as an industry as a whole, like you don't know when those opportunities are going to come back. You know, yeah. so. And his, it's so unfortunate because his career was just starting to really blossom in that way, but he did a great performance. I thought Torgashev looked better. Um, I thought he had way more natural quality to his skating. I'm curious to get your take on Tomoki. I thought he had more personality here than we've seen. Like I thought it was a definite step up from I him. Thought yeah. 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 Thought? I thought he was closer to developing the kind of persona on the ice that it would take for him to really make the Olympics. Well, and that's, and that's this, these, this season will be crucial. What we see now, because I felt like last season was a real opportunity that was missed um, to have solidified um, a move up, but he was just kind of holding on there. It'll be interesting. Do you think he would bump Jason or do you think he would bump um, Vincent. It's going to be a tough go. It's going to be an interesting go. I, if he's a competition, that's such a if, right? I think how they skate. Uh, Vincent, how are those jumps going to be? Is his interest going to be there? Is his health going to be in there? Right. Jason, if he's healthy, he's looking stronger. You know, who knows what is going to um, come about. Jason's getting all the components in the GOE, which is interesting to see how they'll be ranked internationally. We haven't really seen much of it. If Jason came back now with all of his tremendous ability, um, if he could take that incredible spinning talent mm -hmm. and come back now with some new spin positions, I think it would just like set the skating world on fire in a fun way. I think, yeah. I think we're ready for to see some new big wow thing to be revealed in that I, way. Are they working on all of the other details of the skating so much that they just stick with the spins because- Because they're gorgeous. But yeah, it would be so fun to see him kind of get outside of that box a little. Um, but yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> because it's a tough go. I, I think we have four very viable, talented men. Again, if the Olympics happen. But, and hopefully for Torgashev, it's another step up. I thought Camden- yeah. Um, pretty good. I thought Karen. Um, to me, out of the out of the U.S. women, the ones that I think have the most audience appeal would be Karen and Mariah. I just think that they understand the music and obviously. And so what they're, they're what we associate as the golden era of skating. They they are most like those amazing. Um, U.S. champions that go fast, have style, have personality. Like, again, going back to when we were judging 2018, Karen, I mean, that is a talent. Mm -hmm. This is a sensational talent, the speed and the spins and the ability when it, when it goes right. And same thing, who went viral from nationals? It was Mariah. You know, it wasn't our winner who won by a substantial amount. And I, yes, I understand she's young and she's working on the things with 85 different people now and like, but there is that intangible star quality. I think you're great about skating. You could go viral for landing an element like a triple axle or a quad, but you also can go viral because of the performance. And that's right. what Mariah offers, that's what Jason offers. I think yeah. that Karen is really close to Getting. And even though the general public understands when you say like quad or something like that, I have like in my own social experiment shown people Mariah and then Alyssa View. And they, you see that they don't, they're like, why did that girl win? That jump was harder? Yeah. Or you, I mean, it just is such a different takeaway. And Alyssa, it sounds like I'm just like being mean to Alyssa View, but what I'm just saying is, 
when those skaters are rewarded, the public doesn't necessarily get it. It was like when Nathan actually first started, you know, the first national T1. That would have been 2017, or I'm thinking of the, the nationals in 2017, where they kind of tried to force that video to go viral because of the number of quads in it. But a lot of people I knew that weren't skating aficionados that watched it were kind of like, so was that really hard or something? Is that why this is an important video? You know? Um, I think they did okay with that video, but yes, I understand. Um, no, it wasn't like a river dance, which would have everybody much more involved and of course half the technical content yeah i think that's what they do often with nathan skating when they repackage it but yeah it's kind of like trying to sell tim gable a little bit like um, um yeah i i understand what you're saying i get that yeah i think yeah but i think that that competition is good i think they can just develop it more i do think the fact that they did a virtual competition i think nationals this year they're testing the waters yeah because one thing i keep asking people who are international skaters and coaches have you heard anything from the isu have you heard anything what are the rumors what are the you know we have not heard that they're going to do virtual grand prix and it seems like you know there's been discussion about having challenger events but only people in a certain country uh perhaps performing but it doesn't seem like they've really made plans for virtual competitions in terms of... Well, that's when I think if you're the USFS, you have I think you have got to rev up and create your own national season. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have got to get these people competing, even if it's just in the country, like just keep doing it. I think it would be... Just one time uh, even, yeah, twice, twice. Yeah, I think, yeah, agreed. Um, the other thing is that, you know, there's been so much discussion that if Tokyo is canceled, Beijing will be canceled because there's only a six month it turnaround. It didn't occur to me until I was talking to someone last night mm -hmm. and they were asking me like what we knew about the Tokyo Olympics. And then I thought, because again, I think the biggest hurdle facing the Tokyo Olympics is that you just don't show up at the event. Like all of the qualifications, all of the trials, all of these things have to be in place before the Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, for instance, like Broadway and opera and stuff like this, okay, sure, we give like these artificial dates of January 2020 or January 21. No way. There's no way that's happening. Um, I'm sure it will at least be pushed at least until the summer. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but again, that's, you don't just start performing again. You've got to like, reopen the theaters, re-rehearse everything, relaunch every production, and then it's ready. And I find it's the same for the Olympics. And if that's the case, we could be in trouble for the Winter Olympics in Beijing, which I had not really started to wrap my head around yet. I mean, I, and even as the ISU posted their thing saying, okay, let's just use, you know, the information from the previous season for world championships and stuff like that. Already you're seeing what a, what a trauma this will cause with everyone saying everything's unfair. The one thing that I keep trying to ask people, we postpone Tokyo by a year, right? And people are saying that if you cancel Tokyo, it's most likely cancel both. But I think what they're missing is, well, they push Tokyo back a year. Why not plan now to push Beijing back a year? Right. That way, okay. you get ahead. Yeah. get ahead of it. You can likely save one. Right. Plan for that. Right. Rather than, yes, it will, it will affect these athletes, but they're already being affected. Right? What will, what will help more is to have something tangible that they know is much more likely to happen. Yes. Yeah. Because, and that, because I think you need that, that lead up season. Mm -hmm. That's what I would think. I mean, it changes everything, right? But. but if they're already allowing people to compete in 2021 who weren't gonna be eligible in 2020, how can you then not turn around and consider the 2022 aspect? You know, but it just seems like there's a lot of last term head in the sand thing, but I think especially the news in the US from the South, like it's not going away, but I do think that this will be a discussion. When we get to September, uh, I think that- it's Time to get real, yeah. We don't know that the IOC isn't, um, talking about that behind closed doors, but certainly 
um, you know, to and as we've discussed many times with ladies skating, <laughs> it'll change the whole thing. That yeah. one, year, that one year will shift the entire group. Yeah, I, I would just be. Wow, you know, yeah. I just, but I, I think that yeah, that... I didn't plan for that now. You know, going in, you know. It... Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's really unprecedented. And it's interesting because I'm sure it affects every sport in very different ways, but just as it affects skating, it's, it's again, not this date. It's what has to happen before that date that's in question. I mean, I know that there's going to be athlete and mental health. I just know that if I were an athlete preparing right now and we hear different news stories and is there going to be Olympics? It reminds me of when the U.S. was maybe going to boycott, maybe not going to boycott in 1980. How difficult to prepare when you... Okay, so in order to prepare, you have to think about it. You have to believe that the Olympics are going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. You have to be Megan Duhamel stubborn and be like, this is gonna happen, right? Yeah. Every, everyone you've interviewed about their Olympic experience, like she was like, every single decision since that summer has been altered in preparation. For yes. the Olympics. At massive sacrifice, massive sacrifice to fun, to your body fatigue, to all of this sort of stuff. And to do that all for naught or on a whim or on a maybe, mm -mm, that would be really hard for me to stay motivated. Yeah, so think about it. For me, obviously these athletes who are training are not maybe watching the news as much because they're younger, some of them, some of them are not, right? So you know, different sports. But think about, it. I would rather have a concrete date and if I knew that the Olympics were going to be in 2023, I'd be like, yes, we have coronavirus now. God willing, this will be, by that point, I think that there's a much better chance we can move forward. We will have it. I would much more possible it could be ready to happen by then. I would much I... prefer that than this like tossing back and forth. Am I motivated today? Am I depressed today? Am I anxious today? Am I. Do I need a new program this season? Do I not need a new program this season? You know? To me, that's much better in terms of the planning, in terms of what I'm going to work on, what my focus is going to be. I just think that it, it would be very and, different. And I have a feeling this happens in skating. This definitely happens in singing. There's always this line, oh, if we just had more time. If we only had more time, we could really do this. If we had a little bit more time and didn't have to rush for this performance, we could iron out this thing we want to be better. But because of the timeline, we just have to push through. And if you knew that the Olympics were in 2022, and that you were going to have a full maybe, you know, season before it a little bit, you could kind of abandon in this moment the idea of rushing to get ready for something and really dive into that new element you wanted to take the time to explore, but can't because you have to get too ready for the current season. Like, I think that could be, for me, that would be the motivating factor to try to really work up a new amazing spin or to fix something that you never really have time to fix because you're rushing to just get a, a season out there. You know what I mean? I think for someone like Trusova, right? For someone like Alyssa Liu, you can work on those harder elements and then also work on your skating. But if you're running run-throughs, you just don't have the time to like really- no, be... Because it's not the goal. The goal is to get the best product you can in that moment instead of like just exploration. Because what we see with skaters when they train in the summer and they train the harder elements is that they ultimately run out of time if they want to be organized and do well in the Grand Prix, which impacts everything. If you don't do well in the Grand Prix, it impacts how you place at nationals. It's in places if you make the world team. So they run out of time in that. And time. they run out of time. They're doing a Detroit this, they're doing a Liberty Bell, a Liberty Bell that, they're doing a US Classic. Even those things normally start the ball running so soon when, like you say, already everyone's scrutinizing the the new element or scrutinizing the new program. And it's, it could be so amazing for so many skaters that are kind of, have reached a plateau and need this like surge forward in skating skills or technical ability. This could be the opportunity to get it, but as long as they stay in limbo and unsure, I feel like it's hard to commit to just an exploratory. Think about if you're Jason Brown and if you knew that you had like an extra year, or you knew that you had six months where you don't really have to worry about a run through, right? Like, don't worry about it. <laughs> that long program is never happening this year, right? Right. right. You take that time to really get the quad consistent in the program. You're not, you're not like, 
betting on whether or not it's going to happen and then ultimately planning a backup plan, which becomes- and there's no hysteria run. around it. There's no yeah. fire. Take your time. Feeling sore this day, like we know he may be a little bit more fragile physically than other skaters perhaps. Like, so then take several days off from that element because we have the time and then we'll come back to it and you know. Yeah, I think if you're a skater and you, yeah. So that's why I don't necessarily agree that Beijing will be canceled even though Big Pound did say that because I mean, is the money, obviously the money for the organizing committee is that the IOC just, is that Beijing, is that split? You know, the financing, that is an interesting decision. But if the IOC loses one Olympics and all of the lost revenue that happens there, are they going to want to lose two in a row? I think they're going to try to push it to 2023 to get it. And I would, I would think that I would rather plan that in advance. Yeah. Or know how they're going to handle 2021 so that 2022 can happen. That's right. I would. But I think your idea of like, let's just call it now. Let's just prolong it right now. And our chances are so much greater of it happening, which I think is the goal for everyone. Yeah. Think about for Alexa and Brandon. If it moved to 2023, that could be perfect for them. Yeah. Are you kidding? Yeah. They could be really gelling. They could be a big beneficiary of this. Like you're saying, again, you're absolutely right. Even in this time, if, if they know they don't have to scramble to just get a program out there, now they can take the time, even in this moment, to just focus on the stuff that everyone has always said they don't have time to do. But it's interesting, like even with some stuff on a personal level, there are personal projects I've had. Okay, now that I have the time, I'm going to reorganize that closet. I'm going to work on this project. I'm going to do that. And then you really find what you did want to do and didn't have time for and what you just never did because you didn't want to do. Do you know what I'm saying? I think there are some skaters that are like, I don't have time, I don't have time. Now they have the time, they still may not work on the skating skills because it turns out they never wanted to work on it anyway. Yeah, you know what happened to me when I was competing, Jonathan? What? I had a focaccia entrance into my Lutz, okay? I, like, it was the longest back outside edge circle like pattern that you've ever seen in your life. Okay, the arena slew sky, like 25 minute lead up. Really ridiculous, you seem like, well, that video is like actually kind of private. You wouldn't know how to find it, but um, there's one where like literally like the pattern went like that, right? Like it went like into, but I'm like a tense person that needs a million run throughs of things. So like I noticed that I, I, I started flutzing. I started flutzing like three months before I was, two months before I was competing. It was like really going inside and because of my shoulder, it's like every time, but I'm like, do I want to change my let's now? Like I have, I'm competing in like weeks. Like let's not. I'm like, we're just gonna I just, let's pray it's on an outside edge. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know. Like, I'm like, what do you mean? Like, I tried to learn a new Lutz entrance, but like mid competition, like me, like not happening. Like, yeah. are you kidding me? Like, yeah. right. So one of the things is like, since I came back in November, I've wanted to get the Lutz on the outside edge and comfortable and consistent and fixed. And I never like my technique before. I thought it was just like it didn't. So working with the coaches, you know, first thing, like I tried it with Freddie once and, but not really, he just wanted me to do it like his way. And so I like waited and I worked with Victor uh, off the ice. The first freaking one I did on the ice was on an outside edge. He changed it the different way, did it from a straight line, not from the Fakakta outside thing. Like we put a swizzle in there and who cares? It's on an outside edge. Maybe I'll take out that swizzle at another point. Yeah. But just the the way we did the technique and the, the upper arm, and then we looked at the edge of the ground, and I was like, "Because oh. you weren't rushed trying to put together a program and compete it, so now you have the time to really experiment." And that's also my own fault because I'm freaking crazy, right? That like, but who it, isn't? I mean, I'm the opposite sometimes in singing, because then you run a, a weird thing also when you know you want to change it, but you're sticking to it just because that's what you've been doing, and yet you know you don't really believe in it, but you've already committed to kind of this entry, so now you've got to do that entry. Like, in singing, and I think I've mentioned this before, like, if something goes a little awry or I get too in my head, suddenly in the performance, I'll be like, what if I tried this way for the first time ever, out of the blue? Let, maybe if I just try this brand new thing in the moment, Hello, it out. Bella would kick you out, Jonathan. Okay. Yeah. Well, because you run the risk of either being Midori Ito in 92, but you could also be Todd, excuse me, you could be Todd Eldred at the World Championships when it worked, 
or you could be Todd Eldridge at the Olympics when it did not. You know what I mean? Like, you want that D'Artagnan program to make the podium? Do you want to live with that? <laughs> Do you want to live with the fact that you gave Philippe Candeloro a second Olympic medal? <laughs> I mean, nothing. Dream Dream on you. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, but the Japanese women loved him, okay? okay. They okay. were in love with it, all right? Okay. It was no, a well, as, sure. a young, as a young guy, even then, I was like, this is trash, but I'm looking. I'm looking. <laughs> It never did it for me, but I was... No, I was a Stephen Cousins fan when he took it off because he had the fur. Even then, I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, this took a turn. <laughs> well, Jonathan, I have news for you. Tell me. We are, so we have a couple commissions that we're going to do, you know. So okay. We have the 2000... Oh, like DJs? Oh, can I just do like a weird um, insert here? You know what I've always wondered? I think it's in the Beverly, the Celebration skating yeah. book, where you open it and it's that Toller Cranston painting that had, where he has all of the skaters. Oh, okay. Do you remember which one I'm talking about? There's like, I go back and forth on Toller Cranston art. I, I think my part own. that book, okay. Okay, in the opening, I think it had a red background and it kind of looked almost like they were all at the Met or something like that. And they were in fanciful costumes and he does each famous skater of that era, like a group photo, or I mean a group painting. And I've always wondered who owns it, where it is, what's happening, if anyone knows that, I think it would be really interesting. That's a Tyler Cranston painting I would have bought. Some yeah. of them such a shame we didn't have the skating lesson in 76 to be discussing, you know, Queen Dorothy and Diane DeLuke. And Charlie and yeah, I think that would have been a fascinating, uh, that, that's a group of men, because because of Linda, I've because seen of- Team John Curry, but we would have appreciated the theatrics of Tyler Cranston and the drama and the bravado and the- I think I, yeah, it's, that, was a, that would have been a tough call between the two, but we definitely would have been talking about that damn- um, The difference in their TV specials? I mean, one is like very beautiful, maybe a little boring. And then the other one is like, whoa, what is whoa. happening? Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I read all of Toller's books. They're pretty, they're pretty hilarious. I mean, I bet it was a handful, but- um, Did he write those books? Seems like, well, the one I read when they were- Variety. Jonathan, there was a pause. There was a pause there. Oh, I believe he wrote. <laughs> oh, because they're of like the little like gossipy paragraphs. There's that one where he's literally just like Tanya Harding. Here's what I think, blah, blah, blah. Uh, sorry, Bonnelly, here's what I think, blah, blah, blah. Katarina Vest, they're scandalous. Did he diss Queen Peggy in that book? I feel he did. I think so, maybe. <laughs> Dare he? I have to reread it. It is. <laughs> Was that Ice Cube? Son, the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mother, and Peggy Fleming, okay? How? Which, can you talk about, why isn't there a drag queen named Peggy Fleming? Don't you think that should be like a nice, like, <laughs> Peggy Fleming and Dolce, is, yeah, okay. Instead of Wanda Beasley or whatever um, Debbie's alter ego was, I think Oh we, my God, I mean, think about it. The queen could have a bouffant. <laughs> okay. Yes. In the chartreuse, with the spread eagle, and out of a nice waltz jump or something. Oh my god, this is a whole shtick! She it's a like thing. this on stage. Yeah. And so, you know, they all lip sync. And yeah. come on, you could be doing like a persona. Oh. And they do big hair like Peggy was doing. I don't know, I think there's something to this. <laughs> I could get a nose job and do drag. Okay, this is... Thing. Yeah, yeah. For, but for your deviated septum, you and then yeah, you could do it. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. like Linda, you know. Yeah. Tell me okay, sorry, I totally went off tangent on that one. So what are the commissions? We're gonna do the 2018 Olympics next. Jonathan. Okay, the men? Mm -hmm. That is gonna be, a, okay, that was a good event. Jonathan. Mm -hmm. We need to relive 2018. We're making new memories through it. It's great, it's great. Someone mentioned the dance, but it does not come in. So while we're on 2018, we'll do 2018. We'll do it. Yeah. Especially because most of the players, save Javier, are still in the mix. So it's a very interesting kind of thing. I liked our 2018 judging video. They had yeah, it was fun for me to go back because I took away some different take. I, I, I had different takeaways. We had different winners. We did. We, but we definitely shook up that um, podium, didn't we? Yeah. I just, I... But we both knocked one person out and put one person in. Yeah. But our, our order was different, yeah. 
My inner Vanessa Riley comes out when I judge. And I judge. like that. I like that. <laughs> and I'm just going back to ordinals and like completely shifting for my favorites, <laughs> which they do. Let's be honest. I sent Joe the video. I don't know if he watched it or not yet, but. Oh yeah, he'll be, I'm sure he'll have opinions on it. Of course, come on, Joe, we know. I would like Joe to film a response after a glass of wine. Oh my gosh, yes, like just a reaction video of him like being like, that's not right, or like, yes. It's funny. Yeah, come on, Joe. Get it together. Put those red glasses on. And, and the bowler hat, yeah. So the, uh, the one thing is that we had Doug Hahn see alive. Oh, nice. One time. Do you remember when Doug Hot did a video with us? Remember how long it takes him to put the computer together? Like it takes like yeah, more of like a Linda Frediani experience. Like at least an hour to an hour and a half. To get get yeah, to get the setup going. I think it takes us maybe 10 seconds if I'm having difficulty with my wireless headphones at the time. So when I found out that he was going to do a PJ Kwong interview and he shared it, I commented, oh, please say something very Doug Haw. So it's not just us. Because I think it would be amazing if he said something to like, like about Tukimishima and to like watch PJ Kwong dance around that. Yeah, you know, exactly. How... exactly. But the thing is, she would never let him run wild or ask a question about an actual opinion, perhaps. She, she knows how to keep Doug that. Hall, Jonathan, it can come out of anywhere, okay? <laughs> Which is what we love slash dread about hanging He's out. He's been power walking during quarantine every day. I, mean, I get him, I get him, so I like him very much. Yeah. I just know in I, today's social media world, some of the words could be misunderstood. I'm, yes. Of course, right? Yeah. So I would think, but what he gave PJ Kwong was the real dog hot experience. They were gonna do a live and he couldn't get the technology to work. I mean. Live is tricky. Live would be tricky, I think, for, for anyone. But I mean, we basically bad. do it live, we film it, and we just like send it out. But like, for some of our guests, there's, diff there's great difficulty. And I notice this now with Zoom. There's always like the one person of maybe a certain generation who's sitting in the dark, asking what's going on, like is accidentally muted, like. So Geza was trying to get his computer to work for Zoom. And I was like, you, you escaped from the secret police. You defected to America. You can do this, Gesa. Don't worry. You can do that. I promise Zoom is in your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah. It was like, oh, 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 oh. like. It's funny. He liked you. I think he likes to maybe have a glass of wine now again. I don't I got that vibe. Fine. I think it's liquor. I think that's a liquor man. And dark liquor, I think. <laughs> I think. Like the really caloric kind. <laughs> <laughs> Horrible. He's the character. I knew we were good when he was like, he messaged me, he goes, Professor, how do I work Zoom? And I was like, Amazing. <laughs> he knows. He, well, if Dr. Strug is Papa Strug and then you're the professor, this all makes sense. I yeah. mean, don't you want to know now when you see him and Bella watching the Olympics and laughing what they were talking about? Like, or who? Yeah. <laughs> you could just call him Dance Man. Like, that would be his vocabulary working in reverse. So, Mr. So I made the joke that they were like Statler and Waldorf. I think it went over his head, but... Yes, I, I don't think that communist Romania had a great deal of Muppet content. <laughs> He's been here since 1981. He may have I don't seen... think he picked it up then either. <laughs> but he should have. That's a good, that's a good example. I love those guys. I mean, the two of them, right? Now... They love a pun. They love a pun, those guys. I have a nice t-shirt with them on it that I like, like a pajama shirt that says, haters gonna hate. <laughs> Which one would you want to be? I always like the one with the round head and the mustache, for whatever yeah, reason. Yeah, personality-wise, but I want to be the thin one. <laughs> with, like, the cheeks that are a little, like... Yeah, yeah. a little, you know, something. But my favorite Muppet was always Rolf, because he played the piano and did a good pun. But, yeah, and he does, like, piano duets with Victor Borga and stuff, and I love it. I love it. I know you like Miss Piggy. You know, um, not particularly, because I thought she was mean. So like as a kid, I was like, oh, she's mean. I liked Fozzie because I, I liked that he like kind of threw it out there. And I loved, I bought a trench coat or I had my mom buy me a trench coat because Kermit used to wear it for Muppet News. On Sesame Street. Yes. Now let's be honest though, my favorite Muppet is Guy Smiley, who is the, um, uh, the game show host. He yeah. was always my favorite. 
What about Janice? Jonathan. Oh my gosh, we love Janice. And in the my favorite, one of my favorite movies. Now, what have you done, Dave? My favorite Muppet movie is the Great Muppet Caper okay. because they do that Esther Williams water ballet in yes. it. And then there's that big opera singing with them both in the corner, and then Miss Piggy yells at him for having his voice dubbed later. And oh my gosh, they don't make mo models like Lady Holiday and her girls anymore. I mean, that's the kind of fashion that I grew up. I know. Lady Holiday, that is class act. And then when she's telling Miss Piggy her whole backstory, and Miss Piggy finally asks her, she's like, why are you asking, or why are you telling me all this? And she looks at Miss Piggy and she goes, this is plot exposition and it has to go somewhere. <laughs> like these things as a kid, like that I was, come on, Nerea dancing with um, the large pig in Swine Lake, and then he does Baby It's Cold Outside when Miss Piggy's trying to like come on to him in the steam room. I, this, come on, amazing. Amazing. Well, I had a hideaway bed in college, and it always reminded me of the hideaway bed in the Great Muppet Caper because and then the light bulb that would just break once it went out. <laughs> yeah. They and love the a recurring gag. They love a recurring gag. Or, but uh, everyone always talks about oh, Muppet Christmas Carol, so great, so great. Oh, like, yeah, it was good. Muppet Family Christmas where they all go on the icy patch. That's my kind of humor. That's okay. right. Some nice skating moments. Happiness Hotel, by the way, I think is the hotel I stayed at in Vegas for the Skate America competition. It felt <laughs> more similar to the Happiness Hotel than not. So, could they get a better hotel? I was like, that is the hotel that US figure skating would get now. That is where skating, when we were there and we were staying in Vegas, and then we got to the, the hotel where it was the Vegas casino that had shutters uh, on the front. Yeah, it was going for this like New Orleans like kind of thing and it just didn't really work. I mean, it's convenient when it's attached that way, yes. It felt very appropriate. Yeah, yeah, correct. I couldn't believe that Terry stayed in the host hotel. How dare they not put her in? Wait, so I mean, I, we talked about this, right? Like I was on the lawn chair next to her and Diana. And you didn't like go in for a selfie and be like, hi. Like, do you imagine though? Like in those moments, I pretend to be so above it. Like I am not a fan of Terry, I am an equal in my field, so you can take a selfie of me. <laughs> Where How just... were her abs? Did it look like she conditioned? She was, she was pretty clothed, actually. She, but she looks amazing. She's very stylish in person. It's not necessarily my style, because it's very brand name oriented, plastered on it. I'm sure it was like, but she, she and as I'm like creeping, I mean, she must know everyone at the pool knows who she is, but she, um, they had a, from the distance, in the words of Pat Miller, it seemed a very um, cordial relationship. Like I enjoyed seeing her interactions with her daughter, which I then decided has now made me an expert on their personal relationship. And I've decided it's in a lovely place as of October of 2020, 19, yeah. I run in, I don't know if I've said this on the show before, but I've definitely talked about it. But when you're a runner at the Olympics, you have to do like anything and everything, right? So they'd be like, go pick up Bella Caroli from the media center in the golf cart and drive him to the gymnastics arena, which is the national indoor stadium, right? And I would like, go find him. I'd be like, Bella, I'm here, you know. <laughs> you know, you're driving like, I don't know, a couple hundred meters, like, right? And he'd be like, I need to go to the gymnastics competition. And I'd be like, you're Bella. I'm aware of what sport you're associated with. <laughs> I know, like, yeah. we, we did not say it. <laughs> You're like, come sit up here with me, Bella. Let's, let's, let's get the dirt going. It was not TV, Bella, but it was not um, training Bella, but it was, he was watching those, he had these big glasses and he'd be like, watch it. You're like, okay, like. Fascinating. It was, yes. No. But he can turn it on and off. Like, they had him at a, you have an intern dinner to like thank everyone. And actually, the, um, the guy who was really hilarious was Rowdy Gaines, who does the swimming. Mm. Told, like, had all the funny stories. But Bella was there to take pictures with everyone. And of course, everyone wanted a picture with him, you know, and he's, he turns on that persona. But right. then reading Dominique Mochiano's uh, article that came out with ESPN, apparently he was doing that at her father's funeral. They were like taking pictures with Bella. I mean, so I think, you don't know when you're going to get the chance, okay? I understand these people who just for, oh, how often are you going to be able to get 
How many funerals do you attend with Bella Caroli? I guess you need photographic evidence of it. And Dominic Mociano, that queen. I mean, come yeah, on. Exactly. What a great time to be taking pictures of her. Dear. Imagine me. if you could get the, the two of them together. Oh my God, why not a group photo? You know? Tyler Cranston can paint it. <laughs> Marta go. I, d I did not hear that Marta went. Okay, so I just. Hold an edge and look sexy, everyone. Bye. I was like, 